Isaiah 61, robe of righteousness. The uh, first couple of verses that we'll be reading uh, are quoted by, from Isaiah, Isaiah 61, are quoted by Yeshua when he was in a synagogue in Nazareth. And this picture here is a picture of a synagogue uh, in Nazareth, um, a place called Nazareth Village, um, made to look like a synagogue of 2,000 years ago. It's not a 2,000-year-old synagogue. Um, uh, it's used more for, uh, for Torahs and to give a feel and to understand what it was like. Uh, but they made it using the tools and the, and the materials that they would have used 2,000 years ago. And so Yeshua went into the synagogue in Nazareth, and he read, they gave him a scroll of Isaiah, and he turned to Isaiah chapter 61, starting in verse 1, and he read, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then it says he rolled up the scroll, sat down. So it was a short passage he read. He didn't read the whole chapter. He rolled up the scroll, and he sat down, uh, and he said, uh, this is being fulfilled in your eyes today. In other words, he was saying, it's being fulfilled in me. And these things he was doing already in the area of Galilee near Nazareth and, and the surrounding area. Um, he's saying, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. That word anointed, the Hebrew word for anointed, anyone know what the Hebrew word for anointed? Mashiach. Mashiach right? He has Mashiach me. He's called me to be his Messiah. There were three different types of people that were anointed. The prophets were anointed, the Kohanim were anointed, and the kings were anointed. And Yeshua is the embodiment of all three. He came first as the prophet. He is now ministering as our Kohen Gadol, our high priest, and he will uh, return as a priest, a judge, and then he will come as a king and reign eternally. Uh, and so... Those three, and so he's saying he has, he's the embodiment of that. He is the Messiah. The Lord, Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. That's a pretty bold declaration. They understood this as a messianic prophecy. And he's saying it's being fulfilled in your hearing today. The Lord God has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor, and that he was doing. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted. And also he was ministering to those who were downcast, those that were hurt, those that have been rejected, those that were in need. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives. He was setting people free, demoniacs free, people uh, oppressed by evil spirits, people uh, being set free from habits and addictions. He was setting them free, free from sickness and ill and the opening of the prison doors to those who are bound. Again, bound and tied by circumstances and situations. People are being set free, liberated by the gospel, liberated by the good news, liberated by the love of God. And to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Talking about the acceptable year, the timing of the Messiah's advent, the timing of the Messiah's coming as he as, he, as in Daniel, it talks about the, the time that gives the, the prophecy of 490 uh, years till the time of the Messiah would come. And he's saying, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And he's saying, this is being fulfilled in your hearing today. This is the acceptable day of the Lord, the acceptable year of the Lord. I am here, the Mashiach, the anointed one. The Lord God's spirit has been upon me. And if they weren't there present, they had heard stories of, what had happened when he was in the Jordan River and the Spirit of God, like a dove, came down upon him, and when he was in Capernaum and did miracles and other areas, and, and they were amazed at this as they sat there and listened to this outline of the very things Yeshua was doing, and he claimed it as a confirmation 
of Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1, which talked about the Messiah, the anointed one, the Mashiach, and the acceptable year of the Lord. This is quite a, a list, and this is the same list that God wants to give his spirit upon us to do as well. He wants us to preach good tidings to the poor, to the to the poor, physically poor, financially poor, but also poor of spirit, poor in heart, depressed and destitute and lonely and upset and downcast. He sent us to heal the brokenhearted, to minister healing to the sin-sick soul, to minister to those who are uh, hurt and grieving and sad and carrying a weight of Burdens, to heal the brokenhearted, and to set people free. Set people free from the bonds of Satan. Set people free from their past, their guilt, by pointing them to the Messiah, the Lord God, who can set them free. Who can forgive them for the past mistakes. Who can wash the record clean. And who can change us and transform us. Setting us out of the bonds, delivering us. And we can proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. He is coming again. He is coming again soon. Get ready, get ready, get ready. He's called us to do such a work as well. And so as the people in the synagogue, this is the inside of that synagogue, as the people were seated around the synagogue and he was speaking to them, they heard these things and they were amazed. And they were convicted. We've heard these things about him, and he is doing these things, and the scripture does say these things. And here he is proclaiming this right before us. And proclaiming it's being fulfilled in his life. But then at the same time, hope is being stirred up. Satan puts in a seed of doubt. But wait a second. We know him. He grew up in this town. We've known him his whole life. We knew him as a baby. We've seen him running around here. We know him. He can't be the promised one. He can't be the Messiah. And they began to doubt. And they began to say in his heart, isn't he not just the carpenter's son? He can't be the Messiah. And so Yeshua called him on that. He said, why do you doubt in your heart? And they took him then, they took him to the end of Nazareth, the end of the town, and took him to a cliff. I don't know if it was this very cliff, uh, but they tried to push him off this cliff. There I am, the group pushed me off the cliff. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, I was able to hold on. They started stomping on my fingers, trying to get, but God delivered me, and God delivered Yeshua. He, they brought him to a cliff, this, maybe the same cliff. And then the Bible says, and then he just walked through them, walked through the mob, and walked away. And they were not able to touch him. They were not able to stone him. They were not able to kill him. They were not able to throw him off the precipice. Now, it's interesting where Yeshua stopped his reading. Because the verse continues in Isaiah 61, verse 2. Proclaim the year of the Lord and the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of the vengeance of our God. And maybe the people in Nazareth were disappointed that he stopped reading at that point. Well, why didn't you read about the vengeance of the Lord? Why didn't you talk about that? Why, haven't you, why aren't you doing that? We've got these Roman oppressors, and we've got these tax collectors, and, and we've got all these problems, and we've got these, these, these corrupt uh, uh, priest in, in, in the temple that are exacting uh, also money from us and, and laying burdens upon us that the scriptures don't tell us to do and, and condemning us and critical of us. When is the day of the vengeance of our God going to come? When is our deliverance going to come? If you're the anointed one, if you're the Messiah, how come you're not calling down fire from heaven and destroying them? And why didn't you even read that portion of the text why did you roll up the scroll and put it away before you read that text? And that might have been one of the reasons they didn't accept his message. 
Because they were focusing more on this. They were wanting this. Why don't you come as judge? Why don't you come as king? Why don't you come and reign? Why don't you come and destroy the wicked? Why are you coming as this peaceable one, healing and ministering to the poor and helping those that are sad? And We don't want that. We want deliverance from our enemy. We want deliverance from the Romans. We want deliverance from Herod. We want deliverance from Pilate. And maybe he left this verse off. He no doubt knew what he was doing. Because again, the Messiah comes in different stages. The three anointings. First stage was as a prophet. And that's how he came. He came as a human. He came to the people. He came to minister. He came to proclaim God's word. He proclaimed to fulfill the prophecies and to proclaim the prophecies for the future. He came as a prophet. And as the other prophets of old that were rejected and killed and martyred, he also came as the prophet to be rejected and to be killed. And then when he comes again, he comes as the judge. He comes as the priest, separating the wheat from the tares, deciding right and wrong, making the judgment call. He comes as judge. He comes as priest. He comes and the day of the vengeance of our God. So that's the second stage. And so he cut it off there because he wasn't coming in that stage in his first appearing. And he knew that. He knew why he was here. And he didn't try to do more than he was supposed to do in his first appearing. And that's why he has to come another time. To do the second part of this chapter, or this next part of this chapter, to then come and do the vengeance of our God upon the wicked. And a day is coming when he will have vengeance upon the wicked, where he will have the final say, and those that have oppressed us and those that have tried to kill us and those who have killed us will be judged and destroyed. God will have vengeance. We are to wait on him for that. Then in verse 3 he says, And to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. What a wonderful, again, outline of what God wants to do in our lives. He sends forth the comforter to comfort our hearts and to comfort all who mourn. He says, and to console those who mourn, and give them beauty for ashes and oil of joy for mourning. And what type of mourning is he talking about here? No doubt this is nice and, and fitting to those that are mourning, those that are grieving, you're grieving some type of loss, loss of a loved one, loss of some type of cir circumstance in our life, maybe a loss of position, maybe loss of a job, maybe loss of housing, some type of mourning. Certainly God comes to comfort us and console us and give us beauty for the ashes and joy in the midst of our struggle. But I think there's a deeper meaning here. He's talking about the giving a garment of praise, clothing of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And yes, in the physical sense, that can refer to depression and heaviness. But I think there's a, a greater, deeper picture here. That they may be called trees of righteousness, that they would grow up and be strong trees, the trees of Lebanon, strong trees planted by the Lord that he may be glorified. And so the comfort that I, the deeper comfort that he wants to give us, the deeper counsel that he wants to give us, the deeper joy that he wants to give us is not only mourning through the struggles that we go through in this life, but when we are mourning for the sins that we have committed. When we are in grief because of how we have hurt God, because we have how we've hurt ourselves, because how we've hurt our fellow human beings. And when we are bent down and, 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 and sorrow for the sins that we have committed, in that our sins have caused pain in God's heart, that it's our sins that cause the Messiah to be sacrificed for us. When we acknowledge those sins and mourn for them, he's able to forgive us. And he's able to comfort us. 
And he's able to then change that mourning and change that sadness. True repentance with beauty and with joy. And God be glorified in that. But he gives us praise and thanksgiving for his deliverance in our lives, for the victories that he works in our lives. In setting us free from, again, the bonds, the bonds that Satan has held us, held us under, comforting us in that way, and delivering us in that way. In verse 4, and they shall rebuild the old ruins, they shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. Now this, is, again, is interesting because he's now prophesying, Isaiah is prophesying again, that the cities of Jerusalem, as he's done in other chapters, the city of Jerusalem will be desolate and, and broken down and ruined, and, but that it will be built back up. The old ruins will be rebuilt. And the Messiah came not only to, to physically do that, that again was done by Ezra and Nehemiah, but the Messiah came to rebuild, rebuild his people as a temple of the Lord. To make us all fit stones in his temple. That we are the temple of God. That we are the temple of his dwelling. That his spirit wants to embody us and live in us. And unite us together with him as the chief cornerstone. And he wants to use us in building up his kingdom. In building up his might. In building up his power. I just read an interesting uh, fact this week, that St. Petersburg, the highest, in St. Petersburg, the highest percentage in survey, the, the highest percentage of people that have put down their religious affiliation is unaffiliated. There are more people who claim to be religiously unaffiliated in St. Petersburg than any other one religion something like 25%. One out of four people that we meet don't affiliate at all with any religion. And then the next highest was like 20%, and that included like all Protestants or, or, or a grouping of Protestants, like, yeah, like mainline Protestants or some type of Protestants. And then below that um, were Catholics. And so just a, a huge number of people. God has called us to minister to them, to reach out to them, to comfort them that mourn, to set them free from the bonds that they're under, to build up God's kingdom by telling them of the glory of the Lord. The Lord has called us. The spirit of the Lord God is upon us, and he has anointed us with his spirit. He has called us to go forward and to minister to our community to minister to those around us, to build up the kingdom of God. That his name, that they would be trees of righteousness, that God would be glorified in their lives and in our lives as well. Verse 5, strangers shall stand and feed your flocks. So God reaches out to the strangers, to those that don't know him, and calls them and invites them in. And you shall be named the priests of the Lord. They shall call you the servants of our God. God wants us all to be priests for him. God wants us all to be Levites for him. God wants us all to be Kohanim for him. God wants us all to be ministers for him. We don't have a minister and members. We are all ministers of the Lord. So God has called us to be, all of us, to be ministering for him. God's spirit was poured out in the time of Moses on 70 people. And some people were upset at that. And Moses said, I wish that everyone had God's spirit and God's anointing. God wants to pour out his spirit upon all of us and use all of us as his Kohanim, ministering to others, blessing others, comforting others, bringing the oil of joy and the spirit of gladness into their hearts 
setting the captives free, and proclaiming the good news of God's glory in the acceptable year of the Lord. Verse 7, instead of your shame, you shall have double honor. Instead of confusion, they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess double. Everlasting joy shall be theirs. So it claims a double portion. Double portion. Double honor, double portion. He's pronouncing upon us the birthright that we would receive the birthright, that we would receive the double portion of the Lord. Instead of shame, instead of being ridiculed, instead of being mocked for our faith, instead of being mocked for our belief, instead of being mocked for holding to the word of God, while again the percentages of people who deny the word of God, don't believe it, don't hold it as their standard, is growing and growing. We'll be shamed, we'll be mocked, we'll be ridiculed. God will turn our shame into honor. And not only honor, but double honor. As we hold fast to him, as we stay close to him, in face of the oppositions of this world, it's only been a remnant, it's always been a remnant. Not everyone who came out of Egypt went into the promised land, very few. God will give us a double portion. God will give us his double blessing. And he'll change our, our confusion of why, why is this happening into rejoicing and to everlasting joy shall be ours. While the rest of the world is just looking for happiness, saying just be happy, God will give us everlasting joy. And joy is much deeper, much more fulfilling than just this fleeting, temporary happiness. Give us everlasting joy. In verse 8, for I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery for burnt offering. And I will direct their work in truth. I will make them an everlasting covenant. Again, over and over again, he's promising us to us, Everlasting joy, everlasting covenant, trees of righteousness, honoring the Lord. He comes, he gives us everlasting life. He'll change everything around when he comes in his day of vengeance. Because he loves justice. He loves righteousness. And he will judge the wicked. He hates unrighteousness. He hates robbery and robbery, especially for burnt offering. In other words, when people try and get away with sin and try and excuse it away and try and come up with some other way to get forgiveness of sin by robbing God of the burnt offerings that are due him, by offering false offerings, by, false, by offering substitute offerings. In the day of the temple, we would bring an offering, a lamb, we bring it to the Kohanim and, they, and we would sacrifice it there and Blood spilled out and poured around the altar. You take the lamb and have it burnt on the altar. It was to be without blemish. But we wanted to rob the burnt offering. We might take one of our animals that was lame anyway and wasn't good anyway and we couldn't get any money for anyway and wasn't useful anyway and we're sick and we're robbing God in that way. Or maybe we're not bringing the offering or we, we don't bring the proper offering in that day. But now in this day, we have other ways of doing the same thing. By not accepting the sacrifice of the Messiah as our offering. By trying to do good in righteousness to make up for our sin. To try and replace it with good deeds. Oh, we don't need God, we'll just be good on our own. We'll just be good by ourselves. We'll make up our own righteousness, our own standards. We don't have to be held accountable to God, we will make up our own standards that will change and lower continually. Instead of asking for God's forgiveness for breaking his laws, instead of asking for God's spirit to give us power to obey his laws, we make up our own standard, thus we are robbing God of the honor and the justice that he deserves. I hate robbery, he says. 
Malachi, it says we rob God when we're not returning a faithful tithe and a faithful offering. We come up with other ways and excuses not to be faithful and just in that way. We come up with substitute days for, for his Sabbath day. We come up with substitute ways for his ways. He hates the robbery. He hates the replacing. He hates the substituting. He will direct our work in truth. He loves justice. He loves truth. He loves righteousness. There is truth. God's word is truth. Not to be substituted with our own devising, our own plans, our own ideas. Because he directs our work in truth, he leads us in the way everlasting. And he makes an everlasting covenant with us. An everlasting promise with us. And God doesn't go back on his promises. And God's promises come to pass. In verse 9, their descendants shall be known among the Gentiles, and their offspring among the people. And all who see them shall acknowledge them, that they are the posterity whom the Lord has blessed. Again, everlasting joy, everlasting covenant, everlasting righteousness, and a continuing poster posterity whom God has blessed and known around the world for our faith. Something about our faith will stand out as we honor God, as we live this life by his spirit as he did, by his grace, as he did. And in verse 10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. The garments of joy, the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. I remember when I was in, in college one day, and... Uh, there was a, a man who came on campus. He was volunteering and doing some handy work around the campus. And, and, uh, and he was painting this door. And it wasn't this door, but it was marred up and, you know, just, just hand stained and people's scuff marks in their shoes on the door. And, and, and so he was painting the door. And so I, I commented. I said, oh, you're, you're cleaning our door. door. And, uh, and he said, uh, yeah, just like God cleans up our, uh, our sins. And... Uh, and then, you know, then the analogy came in to mind, and, and uh, I said, "Well, God doesn't just cover our sin; right? He washes it clean for us. He removes the sin. He didn't just cover. He didn't just take a, a clean garment and put it over a bloody, oozing, pussy body, and it just stains the cloth. He cleans us up." He heals us. He cleans the door. And he might even strip the door of the, of the old paint, and strip away all the garbage of our past, takes away the carnal nature, frees us from the desire to sin, the enmity towards God, and makes us all new. Strips it all away, gets us back down to the bare, and then maybe varnishes the door, and shellacks the door, and makes it all new. He clothes us with his garments of joy, with his garments of salvation. He saves us. We shall call his name, and there again, salvation, Yeshua's name right there, over and over again in the book of Isaiah shall call his name Yeshua, for he shall save the people from their sin. He takes away the sin. He washes away the sin. And then he makes it all new and covers us over new. Puts his garment of righteousness upon us. His robe of righteousness upon us. And that's what the symbolism of the, of the Talit is. Being covered in his righteousness covered the children, covered in his righteousness. The chuppah over a married couple covering in God's righteousness. 
God wants to cover us with his robe of righteousness. He wants to take away our filthy garments. And he wants to cover us in his robe. That his life may be lived out in our life. That his mind would be in us. That his actions would be lived out in us. The things that he did, he wants to do again through us. He embodied flesh once and he wants to embody flesh in us and live out his holiness in us. He wants to make us a blessing to those whom we come in contact with. He wants us to make, be a blessing in this world. Lifting up our voices, proclaiming righteousness, giving comfort, ministering to those who are downcast, and those that are hurting, those that are grieving, those that are sad, those that are bound, those that are poor in spirit, and blessing them. In verse 11, for the, as the earth brings forth bud, as the garden causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. Where is God springing forth this righteousness? In us. He will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth. It's not going to spring forth out of a rock. It's not going to spring forth out of a tree. It's not going to spring forth out of a building. He wants to spring it forth. He will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth out of us. We cannot force righteousness out. We cannot force praise out. We cannot make ourselves that way. Can a leper change his spot? Can an Ethiopian change his skin? No, no more so can you change yourself. But God can change us. And God will cause, the Lord God will cause, it's a promise, it's a covenant, the Lord God, and it's the Lord God who does it. The Lord God will cause, he will make it happen. He will cause righteousness, right doing, by clothing us in his robe of righteousness. He will cause righteous actions, right thoughts to come forth from us as we allow him to cleanse us, as we give the right burnt offering, as we confess our sins, as we accept his sacrifice, as we come to him with a spirit of mourning, acknowledging our sin and our sinful nature and our sinful carnal ways and our sinful desires and ask him to take those desires and to put them in himself and to bury them away and to give us his spirit of praise and of joy and ask him to have it spring forth. Right? He uses this analogy here. As the earth brings forth bud, as the garden causes things that are sown in it to spring forth. Right? The sower goes and sows the seed. Seed in and of itself is dead. Sows the seed buries it in the ground, and then it springs forth. So also, we need to be dead in Messiah, buried in him, buried in immersion in him, and then we come forth to newness of life. The old ways, the old nature have to be stripped away. The old ways, the old nature, the old desires have to be buried away and killed. Buried with Messiah die in him in order for all things to be made new and for new things to come forth. And God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth out of the new life, out of the new heart, and out of the new mind. So as we pray together, you've been contemplating accepting the Messiah as your Messiah, as your Savior, haven't yet done that. Maybe like the people of Nazareth, maybe you've become accustomed to him. Maybe you've heard about him. Maybe you've known about him. Maybe you've become so familiar with him that you have a hard time accepting him for who he is. Maybe because our society has just played him out and played him down in such a, a way that, that he's nothing more than, in many people's minds, than just a, a, a goody two-shoes that's giving away gifts. You want to accept him as your Messiah. 
They want to accept him as the anointed one. They want to accept him as to forgive you for your sin and to place righteousness in you. And when we pray in a moment, I'll invite you to to do that, to accept him as your savior. Maybe your door has gotten stained over time. Maybe your clothing has gotten stained over time. Maybe your life is stained and marred. You'd like God to set you free from it. You'd like God to remove the sinful garments, the sinful traits, the stain on your record. And you'd like him to give you a garment of prayer, and a garment of salvation, and a robe of righteousness. When we pray, you'll have the opportunity to do that. Maybe you have a spirit of heaviness right now. Maybe you're downtrodden with sin and burden and you need God's forgiveness. When we pray, you can accept his forgiveness and accept his righteousness. Or maybe in the physical realm, maybe you're burdened with some concern and some care and some worry and some grief. Maybe some loss or some pain in your heart, maybe physical or mental or emotional, something that's hurting you. Maybe some relationship, some, some situation in your heart and you're mourning. You want God to comfort you. You want him to bring counsel to your mind and your heart. You want him to replace that with the spirit of praise, with everlasting joy, with his goodness, his kindness. Or maybe God has called you and you sense the calling to proclaim the good news to somebody in particular. God has laid a burden on your heart or an area on your heart, maybe at work or maybe at school, maybe in your family, maybe someone you know, and God is laying a burden on your heart that you need to proclaim the good news in the acceptable day of the Lord and to let them know about the Messiah, the Anointed One. When we pray, you'll have an opportunity to ask God's Spirit to come into your heart and mind and cause you to have the spirit of righteousness and the spirit of praise to go forth and to speak for him, to bring him honor and glory. Or maybe you've been bound up. Maybe you're in some prison, prison of doubt or prison of discouragement, prison of negativity, prisoner to addiction, a prisoner to a habit, wrong habit, prisoner to the carnal nature, prisoner to your past, prisoner to lies, and you want to be set free. In the moment when we pray, you can ask God to set you free, to set the prisoners free, to work his deliverance in your life and your heart. So if any of those areas apply to you, or maybe something else that God has been speaking to you as we read this chapter together, as we pray together, let God work in your life. Our Lord and our God, King of the universe, we're thankful that you came down to earth, that you lived here and you ministered for us. Thank you that you're here with us right now. Touch our hearts and our minds. Lift us up into heavenly places with you. May we see your face. Thank you for calling us and calling us by name. Thank you for calling us in your righteousness. Thank you for calling us on to yourself. Thank you for drawing us to you. Thank you for living out your life. Thank you for being our Messiah. Thank you for being willing to be rejected. Thank you for going through mourning and heartache. Thank you for receiving everlasting life. Thank you for receiving our sins and receiving our punishment. Thank you for your spirit. Come upon us. Live in us and through us and fulfill your will in our lives. In Yeshua's holy name. Amen.